Amen. So Genesis chapter 14, like I said, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't here the last two, but I watched John on the, you know, I was in quarantine, so I watched John on the, on the live stream, and he did a great job. Uh, he didn't say anything that I wouldn't have said, and he said everything that I would have said, so I don't feel the need to go back and fix anything. He did a great job, and that's exactly uh, what, what he gave you is exactly what I would have given you, and so uh, he, he did a wonderful job. Um, and, and what we've seen, really, all the way from chapter 12 up through 13, 14, uh, we're in 14 now, but um, was Abraham's test of faith, really. Abraham is in, I, Abram, Abram, not Abraham, he's in the school of faith, isn't he? He's faced several tests of faith up until this point, hadn't he? What are some of them that he's faced? There's three I can think of right off the top of my head. When he got to the land, what was going on? Famine. famine. That's right. Famine and land. God said, go here. And when he got there, uh, famine. Uh, what's another test of faith that he had that he failed miserably? Where did he go when there was a famine? Went to Egypt. What happened in Egypt? He lied, told, told everybody that his wife was his sister. She is his half-sister, but... And, you know, he did that to get wealth, and you, you, John talked about that, how he accrued wealth, but then it, it was a big oops when Pharaoh came and took her, you know. Um, uh, and then today we're going to talk about, well, even after that, the land was not good enough or big enough to support them with all their wealth. So Lot and Abram had to separate, you know, because there wasn't enough uh, resource, with enough water for the cattle or whatever, you know, and they had to separate. So um, we're going to see that um, he, he's going to face another test tonight. And the test that we're going to look at in chapter 14, uh, this one he's going to pass with flying colors. He's going to show that he is growing in the school of faith. Um, this text, uh, chapter 14, we're going to do the whole chapter, um, it focuses on Abram and Lot and Abram's interaction with these two kings at the end of the chapter. So the first 15 verses of this chapter that we're going to read is all set up. Uh, we're going to talk about kings' names. We're going to talk about the, where they're from. We're going to talk about what happened as they came and, and, and uh, invaded the promised land. But I, don't want you, I want to make sure before we even read those, because there's a lot of big, long, long names and a lot of places you never heard of, um, don't get bogged down in those, those details. We're going to back up and look at it from a big picture overview kind of a, a place. The storyline here is Abram in the school of faith learning to trust God's promise. And when you see him interact with these two kings at the end, you're going to see that he is trusting God's promise. So far, up, in, up until now, from chapter 12 uh, to chapter 14, the promised land just hadn't been looking too promising. You know, of course you had the famine, and then it's not, not big enough for all the wealth that they accrued. And now you're going to have massive armies marching through the land, conquering everything. So, uh, you know, from a, from a worldly perspective, Abram has, you know, he has some reason to doubt uh, whether God's promise is going to be fulfilled. He has some reason to doubt whether this is the promised land and, and you know, all of that. But we're going to see that he... Um, he holds to his faith, and he trusts the promise over the worldly uh, offer that he's given. So uh, uh, I guess none of that may mean anything to you until we actually read the text. So let's get to that. So what you're going to see at the beginning of this text is you're going to see you're going to see war. If my clicker will work, come on, man. Oh, that did something. Look at that. Oh, you can't see it. I can see it back there. That's weird. Hey, uh, reach over there and hit the right arrow button. Maybe that'll just get it rolling on the keyboard. All right. Yeah, I got control now. Okay. So, here we go. In the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, where is Shinar? What is Shinar? Remember? Remember? We talked about Shinar before. Come on, guys. Y'all remember? <laughs> she said it was last year when we did that. <laughs> Shinar was where they stopped to build the Tower of Babel, and it is what? 
It's Babylon, Babylonia. That's right. Later it would become Babylon. So in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Babylon, Arioch, king of Elassar, and Kedolomer, king of Elam. I told you they were big names. Tidal, the king of Goyim. Goyim is a Hebrew word. It means nations. Okay? These kings made war with, and there's some other kings. I'll read them in a second. So what you have in the very beginning here, you have four kings. These four kings are kings of regions. So it's not just a city. So Shinar is the Babylonian region. Uh, the Elam is the region of uh, probably, um, probably modern-day Iraq, Persia, you know, those things. So these are four regional kings. These are big, big armies, uh, big kings. And what they did is they made war with these five kings are kings of cities that are in the Promised Land. So Bera, the king of Sodom. Sodom is a city that's in the Promised Land. Uh, uh, Bersha, king of Gomorrah. Gomorrah, of course, is a city. Uh, Shinab, king of Adma, uh, Shemember, king of Zeboim, and king of Bela, uh, and the king of Bela, that is Zoar. Zoar, was, it was in Moses' day. And all these joined forces in the valley of Siddim, that is the Salt Sea. That's by, Salt Sea is the Dead Sea. So if you're looking at a map of Israel, uh, it's, it's right there by the Dead Sea. So what you have here is you have four kings of big regions, like the region of Persia that's outside the Promised Land, and you have uh, Babylon, which is outside the Promised Land. They're coming into the land, and they're, they're attacking, attacking the land. Uh, five kings of cities inside the promised land are going to go to war against them. Everybody with me? Okay, so what the reason why they're fighting is because 12 years, they, the, the five kings of cities inside the promised land, had served Kedulaomer um, as a vassal state. Uh, so this was, he was probably the guy in charge, uh, and they paid taxes to him, they paid tributes to him, uh, they gave goods to him. It was, it was basically a vassal state where they were taxed. But in the 13th year, they rebelled. They said, we're not paying you anything anymore. We want our independence, and we want to be free from you, so we're, we're cutting ties with you. They rebelled. They declared their independence, and that's why they came to attack them. That's why the campaign began. It says in the 14th year, so they served them 12 years, rebelled in the 13th year. In the 14th year, uh, Keterleomer and the kings who were with him, the, the other three kings of regions, uh, came and defeated, now here's a lot of names, Rephaim of Astaroth Karnaim, that's a place, and Zuzim in Ham, that's a place, and Emim in uh, Sheva Kiriathaim, if that's right, and the Horites in their hill country of Seir as far as El Paran on the border of the wilderness. So they came and attacked all these places. I'm going to show you a map in just a second where all these places are. So they came and attacked. And then it says in verse 7, Then they turned back and came to in Mishpat, that is Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea, uh, and defeated all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who were dwelling in Hazazan Tamar. So what this looks like, I don't know if you can see that from where you are, all of these countries, these regional kings, were uh, to the north and to the east of the Promised Land. And so uh, they were, you know, they were suzerain kings, they were, these were vassal states of all these kings, paying them tribute, all those kings, and when they stopped, they came in, they followed that red line, you see it, they came down the east side, uh, Carnaim uh, Ashtaroth, you see it right there, and they just conquered all the way down the east side of the Promised Land, down to El Paran, this is what the text just told us. They turned back up to go to Kadesh Barnea, and then they went toward Sodom and Gomorrah and all of those places, and that's where the, the, four, the five kings, Sodom and Gomorrah and Elam and all of them, they, uh, they fought right there in the Siddim Valley, which is that... That thing right there, that water body that says Sodom right up, that's the Dead Sea, that's the Salt Sea. Uh, and so they fought right there, and of course they lost, and they conquered, and they kept on going all the way up to Damascus. So we'll look at that again, but I just wanted you to get a picture of what we just read, because there's a lot of, you know, Boaim and Raphaims and all that, and that don't mean nothing to y'all. So I wanted to show you uh, what it looked like as they came down and they... They conquered these things. Remember, don't get bogged down. This is all just background. This is all set up for what's about to happen. 
So it says, Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Edmah, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that's the kings of the cities that were in the promised land, uh, they went out and they joined battle in the valley of Siddim. That is the valley that's right there by the Dead Sea, by the Salt Sea. With uh, Kedor Lamor, La, La, whatever his name is, king of Elam, Tidal, all them other kings. Okay, so the five kings of the cities of the Promised Land went out to fight the four regional kings. Battle ensues. Okay, y'all with me? Everybody with me? So what happens is the five kings of cities in the Promised Land, they get beat bad. Okay, they get, they get tore up. So it says, now the valley of Sidon was filled of bitumen pits. Uh, that's t- it's the same word that y- is used for what Noah put on the ark, like pitch, tar, tar pits. And as the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, so it's, it's, it's not giving us in-depth information about how the battle happened or what happened. It, he's trying to get to his point, and so he just said they lost and they fled. It says some fell into them. Some of the army of these kings fell into these pits, and the rest fled to the hill country. So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and all the possessions of Gomorrah and all their provisions, and they went on their way. That was the red line. They went through Sodom, went through Gomorrah, and then kept on going north all the way up to, all the way up to Damascus. They get beat. Now, what I want you to see, we're going to start getting in depth now, that... that All of this is not so you know who these awesome kings are. And this is is background to God's story. Now, if you were living in in the promised land at this time, if you're living in the land of Canaan and this was going on, this is not a little thing. This is a huge thing. This, is, this would be front page news. This would be world, worldwide headlines if we were you know, in, in, the, in the modern age. It would be across every news channel. It was huge. These, these empire uh, regional you know, bo- uh, bodies, armies, were coming down and attacking all. It was wars, international war that was happening. And so it was, it was a huge world-shaking event, but I want you to see, especially in light of events that are going on today, that this, this huge international world-shaking event is just background to God's story. God is, God is moving history to write His story. All of history is just background. This, the, the theme of this story is Abram being faithful to God's promise, and we're going to see him do that in a minute. But what we see, what I want to make sure you understand is that God is sovereign over history. I told you before, the, uh, I think before the camera turned on, God was sovereign when Nebuchadnezzar was king. He was sovereign when Pharaoh was king. He was sovereign when Nero was Caesar. He is sovereign today, no matter what's going on. We can lament those things that are happening. We can, we can cry out to God for deliverance, as God's people have always done throughout history. But, um, but we, we need to know that God is in control and that Jesus Christ is king of kings. Uh, and he is truly that today as well. So they come, they, they conquer all these cities, they destroy, they destroy these armies, uh, they, they beat them all, and they head back north. They're going back home, I guess. And so what you see in verse 12, now we start getting to what, what God wants us to glean from this. So when they took the spoils, when they took the possessions, it says they also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom, and his possessions, and they went their way. When's the last time we saw Lot? Where was he, where was he at? Yeah, it was, I don't remember what chapter, it's probably chapter 13, somewhere, no, nah, it's chapter 12, end of chapter 12 maybe. Yeah, Lot decided, remember the land was not big enough for them, and Abram let Lot choose which land, he, which side he wanted to go to, and what did Lot choose? Yeah, he chose the best one. I want to go the best, to the best place and the greenest grass and the most water and all that. And it happened to be toward Sodom. So the last time we saw Lot, it said he was pitching his tents toward Sodom. Now, fast forward, where is Lot? He's in Sodom. He's, he's living in the city. Not only, is he, not only is he living in the city... But he looks like he belongs there. He looks like he belongs there so much that they take him prisoner because he's part of the city of Sodom. 
Why do you think he's living in Sodom right now? This is, it's not here. We just, let's brainstorm. Let's, what's your opinion? Why do you think Lot is all of a uh, Lot him. Why do you think Lot is all of a sudden in Sodom? Just give me what you think. Yeah, I mean, nobody knows, so you ain't got no wrong answer. He chose to be close there anyway, so there was a draw, and so he was lured in. Yeah, yeah. He, he pitched his tent toward Sodom, and the draw of the city, the draw of probably the wealth of the city, and you know who, who knows what else, it drew him in. I, I think that's a pretty good guess, and I, I would be, uh, I would be uh, th- that's where I would be as well. Um, and the idea that, you know, you've probably heard many uh, sermons on this, is that, that that old adage, sin will take you farther than you want to go, it'll keep you longer than you want to stay, and it'll cost you more than, than you want to pay. And so what you see is that I, I don't think, and this is just me speaking, this is not in the Bible, so we can, you know, we can converse about it. It's just my imagination I don't, I don't think Lot intended to live in the city of Sodom. Remember, he had goats and sheep and, and all. He was going to be a, a nomadic guy like, like Abraham, you know, like a, like a you know, farmer guy or whatever. Uh, he pitched his tent towards Sodom because that's where the green grass was. That's where the water was. That's where all those things was. And now all of a sudden, he's living inside the city. He was sucked in. And just to give you a little picture of what's coming, after, you know what's going to happen, they took Lot, Abraham's going to go get him, we bring him back. After Abraham comes back and rescues Lot, Lot's going to go back and live in Sodom again. Uh, and then you got the whole thing about the angels coming and to Lot's house and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's, it's really strange. Why would he go back after... You know, 2 Peter tells us that Lot was vexed daily by the the corruption and the sin and the wickedness that was all around him. Why would he go back to live in the city after all of this, after Abraham saves him from uh, from these kings? Why do you think? Just the allure of it, maybe? Huh? He had become a leader. We see him sitting in the city gates, which is the picture of an elder ruling in the city. Yep. Plus... His wife kind of liked it inside him too, didn't she? I mean, I ain't, I ain't going to blame his wife, but there is that. So, yes, huh? Yeah. Well, and, you know, if somebody came up to you and said, you really need to murder this guy. You would probably go, oh, that's insane. I would never do such a thing. But if it's a little bitty sin that doesn't seem so bad, you may be tempted to move one step. And once you move one step, that second step, just ain't, that, that ain't that hard. And then the third step, you know, after that, I'm already here. I might as well. It's not going to hurt anybody. And pretty soon you find yourself knee deep in some of the, some of the most horrific things that you never thought you would be. You never thought you'd be there. Sin has a way of alluring. Uh, James says that um, it's, like a, it's like bait. Satan uses it like bait to lure you away. But sin is a, uh, it's a, what's that text in James where he, temptation is, uh, gives birth to sin and sin gives birth to death when it's fully conceived, something like that. I know I ain't quoting it right, but yeah. And so I think that's what happens here to, uh, to Lot. Lot's biggest mistake in his whole life seemed to be the decision to pitch his tent towards Sodom. Because now, not only was he sucked into the city, but now he finds himself a slave. And presumably his family is a slave, and they're on their way to Persia or, or wherever they're going. You know, they're, they're, they're taken. They're leaving as a slave. And I can imagine Lot just thinking, how, how did I come to this? How did this happen to me? So this is where Abram gets involved. So verse 13, it says, Then one who had escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew. It's the first time he's called the Hebrew in Scripture. And he was living by the oaks of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshol and of Honor. These were allies of Abram. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, 
He led forth his trained men, born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. So you see now this picture of Abram. He's not just a farmer anymore, is he? He's a, he's a clan leader. You know, he's got allies that are around him with him. He's got these 318 men that are trained to fight. They're trained to fight. So he's not just running around with shepherds and herdsmen anymore. He is, uh, you can see growth here where he is, uh, he, he's a clan leader. And why would you think that Abram would get involved? Abram, you know, I put myself in this position. I'm like, well, that's what you get, Lot. You took the best land. Ha, ha, ha. Why does Abram get involved? Glory? Family. Family. Uh, exactly. Abram here is everything that Cain was not. Abram is his brother's keeper. That word kinsman in some of your translations says brother, probably. And so he hears that his brother has been taken captive. We know he's his nephew, but he's his kinsman, he's his brother. And what you see is the same language used in, in that uh, the Cain and Abel, the story of Cain and Abel is used. Abram is his brother's keeper. And so he mounts up 318 of his trained men that were born in his house uh, that are ready to go do battle. And he goes chasing after this, this five or four regional army. I mean, that, that, seems like, that seems like he's pretty bold, doesn't it? I mean... These five kings of cities in the promised land in Canaan failed and got destroyed and were beaten badly by this, this marauding army. And Abraham's going to go after him with 318 guys. What, what do you think is going through his mind? You think He thinks, well, I can take 318 guys and because I'm such a great military leader, I, I'll be able to defeat them. You think that's what he's thinking? What do you think he's, what do you think he's trusting in? He's trusting in the promise. He knows that God has made him some promises and those promises ain't been fulfilled yet. And he has a brother who is in need, a family member who is in need. And so he is going to go after. He's going to go after them and he's going to uh, try to bring good to him. He's going to try to rescue him. And indeed he does. If you look at our map again, this is, that's the green line. So the red line is the armies of the five regions come down through the east turn Kadesh Barnea up through Tamar. That's where they attack. Uh, that's where the Sodom and Gomorrah and Elam, and uh, not Elam, but uh, Zoe, Zoe all, all them other cities. That's where they fight right there under the, under the Dead Sea right there in the middle. And then they take off up north to conquer uh, as they're going and leave toward Damascus back to their homeland. And Abram, who lives in Hebron right there, which is the, by Mamre, it, he takes off after them. And he finally catches them right around Dan. That's what it says. And he divided his forces against them, divided his 318 people against them by night, he and his servants, and he defeated them and pursued them to Habna north of Damascus. He chased them all the way out of the land of Canaan. Damascus is in Syria. That's not in Palestine. It's not in, it's not in Canaan. He chased them all the way out of the promised land before he came back. Then he brought back all the possessions and all, and brought back his kinsmen, his brother Lot, with his possessions, and the women and the people. Now, if that, that moved really quick, and we're given no detail. We're given no detail about how the battle went with the five kings. We're given no detail about how Abraham actually fought to conquer these, these four you know, regional kings. We're given no detail about any of that. All we're told is very quickly in succession that it happened. And the reason why that, that uh, is like that is because that's not the main story. That's the background to what's about to happen right here. So now we get to the meat of the, the narrative and how it applies to the promise of God and the story of God. As Abram comes back, he's got all these possessions, he's got all these people that were taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah and all these cities, he's got all of this stuff with him, and two kings come out to meet him. The first one is the king of Sodom. So after his return from the defeat of uh, Kedorlaomer uh, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. Now, we're going to talk more about the king of Sodom in a minute, but the other king is very interesting. 
His name is Melchizedek. Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and look what he did. He brought out bread and wine. And we're told that he, is, he was a priest of God most high. Most high, the Hebrew there is El Elyon. He's talking about God. He's talking about Yahweh. Uh, and he blessed. This is what Melchizedek does. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram by God most high. He is giving Abram a blessing from God, from the God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And he, and he said, Blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now, listen to this. this. This very mysterious figure, Melchizedek, we're told that he is the king of Salem. Uh, Salem comes from the word shalom in Hebrew, which means peace. Uh, Salem would later be called Jerusalem. So this is the, this is the king priest of what would later be David's city, Jerusalem. Uh, and uh, what you see is that he is a priest of God, which is really strange, isn't it? I mean, we're in, basically we're in a pagan land. God, uh, God sent Abram to a pagan land. Uh, he promised him that he would have the land, that he would have descendants numerous as this guy. And in the middle of this pagan land, we find this mysterious figure who is both a king and a priest, uh, and he is a believer in the Most High God. He's a believer in, in Yahweh, in, in God. Um, how did he come to believe in the true God? I don't know. I don't know. It could be, you know, remember Abraham traveled from north to south in the promised land, building altars and proclaiming the name. Could be. I don't know. I don't know. We're not told. And that's kind of the point. If you look, uh, we're not going to read it just because it's so long, but if you look in Hebrews 7, uh, Hebrews 7, the writer of Hebrews compares this Melchizedek, who is both a king and a priest, uh, to Jesus. To, he's a foreshadow of who Jesus will be. He is both king and priest. He brings Abram bread and wine. What does that remind you of? The communion, Lord's Supper, yeah. And, and so you have all these pictures of, of who Jesus is in this person. In fact, even David in Psalm 110, in this messianic psalm, talking about Jesus who would come later, he says, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, talking to the Son, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now there's a lot of, there's a, there's a convoluted argument that the writer of Hebrews uh, employs saying the reason why he's of the order of Melchizedek is because he lives forever and he doesn't have beginning. And the reason he says that is because Melchizedek wasn't, he, you know, he don't live forever and he, he had a mother and father, but there's no record of him at all. He is this mysterious figure that we don't know where he come from. We don't know how he got there. We don't know. We don't know anything about him. And so the writer of Hebrews compares Melchizedek uh, as, a picture of, as a picture of Jesus Christ. And he brings him bread and wine. He blesses him from God. Like he, he blesses Abraham. Let me see if I got it on the next slide. Yeah. He said he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham by God most high. It's almost like he is interceding for Abraham from God. He's telling Abraham, may God bless you. God is blessing you. And then he blesses God uh, for giving Abram the victory. So he's giving Abram uh, a blessing on behalf of God. It sounds like he's speaking for God. It sounds like he's a priest, a uh, mediator. He's also a priest king. And more importantly, who does he give the glory to for Abraham's victory? He gives the glory to God. He doesn't give it to Abraham. He doesn't say, Abraham, you are just the greatest guy ever. You, you have done just a wonderful thing. But, uh, you know, he gives the glory to God. Now, Abram recognizes this is a spiritual brother here. This is a priest of the God that I serve. This is, this is one who is uh, uh, speaking for God. Incidentally, this is the first time in the Bible that the word priest and the concept of priest is used. Um, and he sees that, and Abraham honors him. How does he honor him? Gave, gives him a tenth of everything. This is the first time you see the concept of the tithe. The word tithe means 
tenth. That's what it means. And so uh, he gave him a tenth. He honors him by paying a tithe. Now, understand, he's not paying. He is paying a tithe to God through Melchizedek. He's paying a tithe through, to God through Melchizedek. So he is honoring God with a tenth of what, he has, uh, what God has allowed him to have. Remember, Melchizedek said God is the one who gives you the victory. And so because God has given him the victory, he gave a tenth of everything that he had to, uh, to Melchizedek. I have a quote here I'll read to you. It says, these are, these are two or three quotes by two or three different scholars. He says, Melchizedek is a type and a foreshadow of Christ. Melchizedek was the godly Canaanite priest king of Jerusalem who served the true God, El Elyon, which is the God Most High. Uh, Melchizedek, like Abram, had come to believe in the one true God. Abraham had found him to be a true spiritual brother and therefore accepted his provision, the bread and the wine, and accepted his blessing because it was from God, and then gave, gave Melchizedek a tenth of everything. In effect, Abram was bowing down before Melchizedek by paying him tithes. In Hebrews, it says the same thing, that uh, the inferior is the one who, who gives tithe to the, to the superior, something like that, talking about the priesthood of Melchizedek. Abram bowed before the one who was holding the place for the future Davidic dynasty and its ultimate son, Jesus Christ. So what you see in this picture here is... You have two kings, and the first one, we had not talked about the second one yet, but the first one is this, I don't know how to put it that would be most beneficial, but he is, he is a man of God. He is a priest of God. He is a king of Salem, which would later be Jerusalem. He is uh, the picture of a priest king who offers the bread and the wine, the communion uh, to Abram, the, the parallels to Jesus Christ and, and his coming are just striking uh, with, with this uh, mysterious person, Melchizedek. Well, so the king of Sodom is there as well to greet Abraham as he comes back. And the king of Sodom wants in on the action. So in verse 21, it says, And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the persons. He said, All the people that you, that you rescued from those other kings that, you, that came out of Sodom, give me them, but take the goods for yourself. He offers Abraham all the money, all the goods, all the provisions, all the stuff. He says, Just let me have my people. Now, what did the king of Sodom do in this war that they just fought? He got beat, what he did. He didn't do nothing. And of course, you know as well as I do, ancient warfare, the, the, the spoils go to who? The one who is. All this stuff belongs really by right to Abraham or to Abram. I keep saying Abram, Abraham, it's Abram. Um, and so it seems like so the king of Sodom is just being so generous when reality is he has an ulterior motive. And Abram senses this. In verse 22, he says, But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand to the Lord, which means he made a promise, he made a pledge to the Lord. God most high, same word that Melchizedek just used, El Elyon. I've made a promise, I've lifted my hand to the Lord, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, the same language Melchizedek just used, that I would not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you say I have made Abram rich. Do you see the contrast? Melchizedek gives God the glory for Abram's victory. Uh, King of Sodom wants to pay Abram for his victory. And Abram recognizes that he has an ulterior motive. And he said, I made a promise. I made a pledge. I raised my hand to God that I'm not going to take nothing from you. Because if I take anything from you, you're going to run around telling folks that I have made Abram rich. Uh, Sodom, the king of Sodom wants to, he sees an opportunity to join himself with Abram. I mean, re remember this guy, he's not just a pea farmer. You know, he's, he's got a big clan. He's a mighty warrior, just proved it by taking 318 men and conquering the army that whooped the other king's rears. Uh, he is, he, he's a force to be reckoned with. And the king of Sodom sees himself uh, an opportunity here to, to align with him. And Abram says, no, he made this vow because he doesn't want the king of Sodom to be able to say, I have made Abram rich. When did Abram learn this lesson? 
How many people on the planet right now, as Abraham's talking, have the ability to say, I have made Abram rich? There's just one. Who was it? Where did Abram get all his stuff? Pharaoh. Pharaoh. Yeah. And he learned a good lesson, didn't he? He brought his wife down there and said she was his sister and thought he was going to have all these folks courting her and bringing him gifts and stuff. And then they were going to skip town when Pharaoh came and took her. And then still Pharaoh lavished all these gifts upon him. And it was God who intervened and they left. And remember, Pharaoh let him keep all the stuff. And so Abram returns to the promised land. He left Egypt shamed and humiliated and repentant. Remember the next thing that happened we saw in the next chapter that he went back to the altar that he built and he worshiped God. So evidently somewhere in there he made a vow to God that he would no longer trust in worldly things or do deceitful things in order to get worldly things. He would trust in the promise of God. So what you see here is Abram taking another step in the school of faith. He has learned a lesson from what he did in Egypt. Unfortunately, he didn't learn it too well because he's going to repeat it you know, in a couple of chapters. But he, he learned a lesson from what happened in Egypt. And now he's telling the king of Sodom, it, it, it would have been very offensive. I mean, you're talking to supposedly the king of the city and you say, look, I ain't taking nothing. I ain't even taking a shoe strap from you because I know that if I do, you'll run around saying, oh, I made Abram rich and he owes me a favor and me and him are like this. And he said, I'm not going to do that. But think about this for a minute. It was a very tempting offer, wasn't it? You just keep it all. You just keep it all and bring it back to your camp or wherever you're staying. And you, I mean, that's, that's a lot of wealth. But Abram knew that to keep this, especially with a man like Sodom, we've already been told that Sodom was wicked, uh, it was robbing God of glory. Melchizedek had just given God all this glory. Uh, he had blessed Abraham from God. He had communed with Abraham through the bread and wine. He had uh, given God glory for allowing Abraham to have this victory. And now on the other side, you have the king of Sodom saying... You know, me and you need to get together. I'll tell you what, you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back. You take all this stuff and just give me the people and, you know, uh, we can align ourselves together. Who knows what all was going through Abram's mind. One king gave a blessing and gave glory to God. The other king offered riches and, of course, he wanted something in return. Anything that the world offers has always got strings attached. But the last verse here... And then we'll, we'll take questions or, or whatever till 7.30. Um, Abram did not take anything from the king of Sodom, but he did use what was given, use some of the spoils to take care of his brothers, to take care of his allies. He says, I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of men who went with me. Let Honor, Eshel, and Mamre, remember those are his allies that we saw earlier in the text, uh, take their share. Abram said, listen, I'm not taking nothing from you, but you make sure that these guys are taken care of because they were faithful and they rode with me and they, they went to help. Um, he does take care of his brothers, and this is another example where we see that Abram, unlike Cain, is his brother's keeper. So really, all of that, all of that international intrigue and international war and all of the armies and all of the you know, bloodshed and all the things you can imagine that went on, all of that was just background to show us that Abraham is growing in the school of faith. He's growing in his faith toward God because here, unlike in Egypt, he refused to trust in the world and what the world offers him. He, re he refused to align himself with the world, king of Sodom. Instead, he no doubt trusted the promise because he said, I raised my hand to God and I promised that I wouldn't take anything from you. If I'm going to be rich, it's because God made me rich. If I'm going to be successful, if I'm going to be given glory or whatever, it's because God is going to do it. In this scene, you see, he is trusting. He's trusting the promise and he's not worried about not having enough or having lack or having any of that stuff because God has made him a promise and he's trusting in that promise. Lesson here for us is simple. We have promises. We have promises from God. As Christians, Old Testament, New Testament, we have promises. Give me a promise. Name one. 
Anyone? I will never leave you or forsake you. Never leave you or forsake you. What's another one? Right, I'll never let you be tempted. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Any more that you can, you can bear. Um, ones that come to my mind are, of course, uh, work for good for those who love God. I'll supply your every need according to His riches and glory. I mean, on and on and on and on. We have those promises. We don't have to trust or put our hope in what the world offers. We don't have to put our hope in what the world um, what the world says is good for us. We don't have to put our hope in the world at all because whenever we do that, there's always strings attached. There's always that pitching our tent towards Sodom because it's better looking. And then we get sucked into the city and then we're leading the city. And it's just like Lot. The world and sinfulness will always pull you into it. We don't, we don't have to fret. We don't have to worry. We don't have to fear worldly might. You know, right now, a lot of things ain't going the way we want them to go as far as government, as far as elections, as far as all that kind of stuff. You know, and then you have utter stupidity going on. We can lament those things. We can pray for those things. We, but we don't have to be afraid of those things. Our God is in control, and God is sovereign. And yes, it may mean we have to suffer. And you know what? I'm not going to enjoy it, I promise you, so I'm right there with you. But if it means His kingdom is going to advance, then okay, let's do it. Let's suffer. You know, we don't have to be afraid because we have promises. We have all the promises in His Word, and those are more trustworthy than anything else that the world can offer us. Even the good things of the world. I'm not saying uh, just bad things. Don't mess with I'm Even the good things of the world. We can't, we can't put our hope in them, our trust in them, our faith in them. That's not where our hope comes from. It's not where our hope lies. Our hope lies in Jesus Christ and the promises that He has given us. And that's what Abraham did. He turned down a lot of money because he trusted that God would take care of him. Questions, comments, cries of outrage. I'm just thinking, trust in the Lord in all of your ways. And that's not him. You can't trust him. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. That's what Abraham did. That's right. It's exactly what it is. That was what Proverbs 1, 3, 3 through 5? Proverbs 3. Yeah, yeah. Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding and he will direct your path. Yep. Any other questions, comments? Okay, let's pray and we'll turn the camera off and if y'all want to talk some more, we can. Father, we love you. We thank you today for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, God, that the promise to us through Jesus Christ today is just as powerful and as potent and as trustworthy as the promise you made to Abraham. God, we can look back and we can see how the promise was fulfilled to Abraham, God, but it's by faith we look forward and anticipate the fulfillment of promise. God, and if you decide to come back tomorrow, we're going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice and we're going to sing and we're going to spend eternity with you. God, we, we are so looking forward to the hope of eternity. God, we pray again, once again, we pray that you would be with our nation. We don't like to see these things. We lament over the things that are going on, the, the distrust and the, the commotion and the violence. And uh, God, it's been, going on, it's been going on since summer, God, with that that our nation has just had unrest from one group or another group or what. God, we, we pray for peace. We pray that you would give us peace, um, uh, physical peace in the midst of our nation and that you would turn our nation back to you. God, we pray for a revival. And it starts with us as we give the gospel to our friends and neighbors. Lord, we thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen.